Chapter Ten of the Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Early in the morning, a slight noise wakened Raisky, and he sat up to see Mark disappear through the window. He does not like the straight way, he thought, and stepped to the window. Mark was going through the park, and vanished under the thick trees on the top of the precipice. As he had no inclination to go to bed again, he put on a light overcoat and went down into the park, too, thinking to bring Mark back. But he was already far below, on the bank of the Volga. Raisky remained standing at the top of the precipice. The sun had not yet risen, but his rays were already gilding the hilltops. The dew-covered fields were glistening in the distance, and the cool morning wind breathed freshness. The air grew rapidly warmer, giving promise of a hot day. Raisky walked on in the park, and the rain began to fall. The birds sang as they darted in all directions seeking their morning meal, and the bees and the humblebees hummed over the flowers. A feeling of discomfort came over Raisky. He had a long day before him, with the impressions of yesterday and the day before still strong upon him. He looked down on the unchanging prospect of smiling nature, the woods, and the melancholy Volga, and felt the caress of the same cooling breeze. He went forward over the courtyard, taking no notice of the greetings of the servants or the friendly advances of the dogs. He intended to go back to his room to turn the tenseness of his mood to account as an artistic motive in his novel but as he hurried past the old house, he noticed that the door was half open and went in. Since his arrival he had only been here for a moment with Marfinka and had glanced into Vera's room. Now it occurred to him to make a closer inspection. Passing through his old bedroom and two or three other rooms, he came into the corner room, then, with an expression of extreme astonishment in his face, he stood still. Leaning on the window sill, so that her profile was turned towards him, stood a girl of two or three and twenty, looking with strained curiosity as if she were following someone with her eyes down to the bank of the Volga. He was startled by the white, almost pallid face under the dark hair, the velvet black eyes with their long lashes. Her face, still looking anxiously into the distance, gradually assumed an indifferent expression. The girl glanced hastily over park and courtyard, then, as she turned and caught sight of him, shrank back. "'Sister Vera!' he cried. Her face cleared, and her eyes remained fixed on him with an expression of modest curiosity as he approached to kiss her. She drew back almost imperceptibly, turning her head a little so that his lips touched her cheek, not her mouth, and they sat down opposite the window. Impatient to hear her voice, he began, How eagerly I have expected you, and you have stayed away so long. Marina told me yesterday that you were here. Her voice, though not so clear as Marfinka's, was still fresh and youthful. Grandmother wanted to send you word of my arrival, but I begged her not to tell you. When did you return? No one told me you were here. Yesterday, after supper. Grandmother and my sister don't know I am here yet. No one saw me but Marina. She threw some white garments that lay beside her into the next room, pushed aside a bundle, and brought a table to the window. Then she sat down again, with a manner quite unconstrained as if she were alone. I have prepared coffee, she said. Will you drink it with me? It will be a long time before it is ready at the other house. Marfinka gets up late. I should like it very much, he replied, following her with his eyes. Like a true artist, he abandoned himself to the new and unexpected impression. You must have forgotten me, Vera, he remarked after a pause with an affectionate note in his voice. No she said, as he poured out the coffee. I remember everything. 
how was it possible to forget you when grandmother was forever talking about you he would have liked to ask her question after question but they crowded into his brain in so disconnected a fashion that he did not know where to begin i have already been in your room forgive the intrusion he said there is nothing remarkable here she said hastily looking around as if something not intended for strange eyes might be lying about nothing remarkable quite right what book is that he put out his hand for the book under her hand she rapidly drew it away and put it behind her on the shelf you hide it as you used to hide the currants in your mouth but show it me do you read books that may not be seen he said laughingly as she shook her head heavens how lovely she is he thought and he wondered how such beauty could have lost its way in such an outlandish place he wanted to touch some answering chord in her heart wanted her to reveal something of her feelings but his efforts only produced a greater coldness my library was in your hands yes but later leonid ivanovitch took it over and i was glad to be relieved of the charge but he must have left you a few books oh no i read what i liked and then surrendered the books what did you like she looked out of the window as she answered a great many i have really forgotten do you care for music she looked at him inquiringly before she said does that mean that i play myself or like to hear music both i don't play but i like to hear music but what music is there here but what are your particular tastes again she looked at him inquiringly do you like housekeeping or needlework do do embroidery no marfinka likes and understands all those things but what do you like a book only occupies you for a short time you say that you don't do any needlework but you must like something flowers perhaps flowers yes in the garden but not in the house where they have to be tended i love this corner of god's earth the volga the precipice the forest and the garden these are the things i love she said looking contentedly at the prospect from the window what ties bind you to this little place she gave no answer but her eyes wandered lovingly over the trees and the rising ground and finally rested on the dazzling mirror of water it is a beautiful place admitted raisky but the view the river bank the hills the forest all these things would become tedious if they were not inhabited by living creatures which share our feelings and exchange ideas with us she was silent vera said raisky after a pause ah she said as if she had only just heard his remarks i don't live alone grandmother marfinka as if you shared your sympathies and thoughts with them but perhaps you have a congenial spirit here vera nodded her head who, who is that happy individual he stammered urged on by envy terror and jealousy the pope's wife with whom i have been stopping said vera as she rose and shook the crumbs from her apron you must have heard of her the pope's wife he repeated when she is here with me we both admire the volga we are never tired of talking about it will you have some more coffee may i have it cleared away the pope's wife he repeated thoughtfully without hearing her question and the smile on her lips passed unobserved but will you have some more coffee uh, no do you care for grandmother and marfinka whom else should i hold dear well me he retorted jesting you too she said looking gaily at him if you deserve it how does one earn this good fortune he asked ironically love they say is blind gives herself without any merit is indeed blind she rejoined yet sometimes love comes consciously by way of confidence esteem and friendship i should like to begin with the last and end with the first so what must one do dear sister to attract your attention not to make such round eyes as you are doing now for instance not to go into my room without me not to try to find out what my likes and dislikes are what pride tell me sister forgive my bluntness 
Do you pride yourself on this? I ask because grandmother told me you were proud. Grandmother must have her finger in everything. I'm not proud. In what connection did she say I was? Because I have made a gift of these houses and gardens to you and Marfinka. She said that you would not accept the gift. Is that true? Marfinka has accepted on the condition that you do not refuse. Grandmother hesitated and has not come to a final decision, but waits, it seems, to see what you will say. And how shall you decide? Will a sister take a gift from a brother? Yes, I accept. But no, I can buy the estate, sell it to me. I have money, and will pay you fifty thousand roubles for it. I will not do it that way. She looked thoughtfully out on the Volga, the precipice, and the park. Very well. I agree to anything you please, so long as we remain here. I will have the deed drawn up. Yes, thank you, she said, stretching out both hands to him. He pressed her hands and kissed Vera on the cheek. She returned the pressure of his hands and kissed the air. You seem really to love the place and this old house. And you, do you mean to stay here long? I don't know. It depends on circumstances, on you. On me? Come over to the other house. I will follow you. I must first put things straight here. I have not yet unpacked. The less Raisky appeared to notice Vera, the more friendly Vera was to him. Although, in spite of her aunt's wishes, she neither kissed him nor addressed him as thou. But as soon as he looked at her overmuch, or seemed to hang on her words, she became suspicious, careful, and reserved. Her coming made a change in the quiet circle, putting everything in a different light. It might happen that she said nothing, and was hardly seen for a couple of days, yet Raisky was conscious every moment of her whereabouts and her doings. It was as if her voice penetrated to him through any wall, and as if her doings were reflected in any place where he was. In a few days he knew her habits, her tastes, her likings, all that love on her outer life. But the indwelling spirit, Vera herself, remained concealed in the shadows. In her conversation she betrayed no sign of her active imagination, and she answered a jest with a gay smile, but Raisky rarely made her laugh outright. If he did, her laughter broke off abruptly to give place to an indifferent silence. She had no regular employment. She read, but was never heard to speak of what she read. She did not play the piano, though she sometimes struck discords and listened to their effects. Raisky noticed that their aunt was liberal with observation and warnings for Marfinka, but she said nothing to Vera, no doubt in the hope that the good seed sown would bear fruit. Vera had moments when she was seized with a feverish desire for activity, and then she would help in the house and in the most varying tasks with surprising skill. This thirst for occupation came on her especially when she read reproach in her aunt's eyes. If she complained that her guests were too much for her, Vera would not bring herself to assist immediately, but presently she would appear in the company with a bright face, her eyes gleaming with gaiety, and astonished her aunt by the grace and wit with which she entertained the visitors. This mood would last a whole evening, sometimes a whole day, before she again relapsed into shyness and reserve, so that no one could read her mind and heart. That was all that Raisky could observe for the time, and it was all the others saw either. The less ground he had to go on, however, the more active his imagination was in seeking to divine her secret. She came over every day for a short time, exchanged greetings with her aunt and her sister, and returned to the other house, and no one knew how she passed her time there. Tatiana Markovna grumbled a little to herself, complained that her niece was moody and shy, but did not insist. For Aisky, the whole place, the park, the estate with the two houses, the huts, the peasants, 
the whole life of the place had lost its gay colors but for vera he would long since have left it it was in his melancholy mood that he lay smoking a cigar on the sofa in tatiana markovna's room his aunt who was never happy unless she was doing something was looking through some accounts brought her by savelli before her lay on pieces of paper samples of hay and rye marfinka was working at a piece of lace vera as usual was not there vasilisa announced visitors the young master from kolchina nikolai andreevich vikentiev please enter marfinka colored smoothed her hair gave a tug to her fichu and cast a glance in the mirror raisky shook his finger at her making her color more deeply the person who stayed one night here said vasilisa to raisky is also asking for you ah rakushka asked tatiana markovna in a horrified tone ah, yes said vasilisa raisky hurried out how glad he is how he rushes to meet him don't forget to ask him for the money is he hungry i will send food directly cried his aunt after him there stepped or rather sprang into the room a fresh-looking well-built young man of middle height of about twenty-three years of age he had chestnut hair a rosy face grey-blue keen eyes and a smile which displayed a row of strong teeth he laid on a chair with his hat a bunch of cornflowers and a packet carefully done up in a handkerchief good day tatiana markovna good day marfa vasilievna he cried he kissed the old lady's hand and would have raised marfinka's to his lips but she pulled it away though he found time to snatch a hasty kiss from it you haven't been to see us for three weeks said tatiana markovna reproachfully i could not come the governor would not let me off orders were given to sell up all the business in the office said Vikentiev so hurriedly that he nearly swallowed some of the words. "'That is absurd. Don't listen to him, Granny,' interrupted Marfinka. "'He hasn't any business, as he himself said. I swear I'm up to my neck in work. We are now expecting a new chief clerk, and I swear by, by God we have to sit up into the night. It is not the custom to appeal to God over such trifles. It is a sin.' said tatiana markovna severely what do you mean is it a trifle when marfa vasilievna will not believe me and i by god again is it true tatiana markovna that you have a visitor has boris pavlovich arrived was it he i met in the corridor i have come on purpose you see granny he has come to see my cousin otherwise he would have stayed away longer wouldn't he as soon as i could tear myself away i came here yesterday i was at kolchina for a minute with mamma is she well thanks for the kind thought she sends her kind regards and begs you not to forget her name day many thanks i don't know whether i can come myself i am old and fear the crossing of the volga without you granny vera and i will not go we too are afraid of crossing the volga be ashamed of yourself marfa vasilievna what are you afraid of i will fetch you myself with our boat our rowers are singers under no circumstances will i cross with you you never sit quiet in the boat for a minute what have you got alive in that handkerchief see granny i'm sure it's a snake i have brought you a carp tatiana markovna which i have caught myself and these are for you marfa vasilievna i picked the cornflowers here in the rye you promised not to pick any without me now you have not put in an appearance for more than two weeks the cornflowers are all withered and what can i do with them come with me and we'll pick some fresh ones wait called tatiana markovna you can never sit quiet you have hardly had time to show your nose the perspiration still stands on your forehead and you are aching to be off first you must have breakfast and you marfinka find out if that person markushka will have anything but don't go yourself send yegorka marfinka seized the carp's head with two fingers but when he began to wave his tail hither and thither she uttered a loud cry hastily dropped him on the floor and fled down the corridor 
Vikentiev hurried after, and a few moments later, Tatiana Markovna heard a gay waltz in progress, and a vigorous stampede as if someone were rolling down the steps. Soon the two of them tore across the courtyard to the garden, Marfinka leading, and from the garden came the sound of chattering, singing, and laughter. Tatiana Markovna shook her head as she looked through the window. Cocks, hens, and ducks fled in panic, the dogs dashed barking at Marfinka's heels, the servants put their heads out of the windows of their quarters, in the garden the tall plants swayed hither and thither, the flower beds were broken by the print of flying feet, two or three vases were overturned, and every bird sought refuge in the depths of the trees. A quarter of an hour later, the two culprits sat with Tatiana Markovna as politely as if nothing had happened. They looked gaily about the room and at one another, as Vikentiev wiped the perspiration from his face, and Marfinka fanned her burning face with her handkerchief. "'You are a nice pair,' remarked Tatiana Markovna. "'He is always like that,' complained Marfinka. "'He chased me. Tell him to sit quiet.' It wasn't my fault, Tatiana Markovna. Marfa Vasilievna told me to go into the garden, and she herself ran on in front. He is a man, but it does not become you, who are a girl, to do these things. You see what I have to endure through you, said Marfinka. Never mind, Marfa Vasilievna. Granny is only scolding a little, as she is privileged to do. What do you say, sir? said Tatiana Markovna, catching his words. Come here, and since your mamma is not here, I will box your ears for you. But, Tatiana Markovna, you threaten these things and never do them, he said, springing up to the old lady and bowing his head submissively. Do box his ears well, Granny, so that his ears will be red for a month. How did you come to be made of quicksilver? said Tatiana Markovna affectionately. Your late father was serious, never talked at random, and even disaccustomed your mother from laughter. Ah, Marfa Vasilievna, broke in Vikentiev, I have brought you some music and a new novel. Where are they? I left them in the boat. That's the fault of the cop. I will go and fetch them now. In a moment he was out of the door, and Marfinka would have followed if her aunt had not detained her. What I wanted to say to you is, she began. She hesitated a little, as if she could not make up her mind to speak. Marfinka came up to her, and the old lady smoothed her disordered hair. What then, Granny? You are a good child, and obey every word of your grandmother's. You are not like Verochka. Don't find fault with Verochka, Granny. No, you always defend her. She does indeed respect me, but she retains her own opinion and does not believe me. Her view is that I am old, while you two girls are young, know everything and read everything. If only she were right. But everything is not written in books, she added with a sigh. What do you want to say to me? asked Marfinka curiously. That a grown girl must be a little more cautious. You are so wild, and run about like a child. I am not always running about. I work, sew, embroider, pour out tea, attend to the household. Why do you scold me, grandmother? she asked with tears in her eyes. If you tell me I must not sing, I won't do it. God grant that you may always be as happy as a bird. Sing, play, then why scold me? I don't scold you. I only ask you to keep within bounds. You used to run about with Nikolai Andreevich. Marfinka reddened and retired to her corner. That is no harm, continued Tatiana Markovna. There is nothing against Nikolai Andreevich, but he is just as wild as you are. You are my dearest child, and you will remember what is due to your dignity. Marfinka blushed crimson. 
don't blush darling i know that you will do nothing wrong but for other people's sake you must be careful why do you look so angry come and let me kiss you nikolai andreevich will be here in a moment and i don't know how to face him before tatiana markovna could answer vikentiev burst in covered with dust and perspiration carrying music and a book which he laid on the table by marfinka give me your hand marfa vasilievna he cried wiping his forehead how i did run with the dogs after me marfinka hid her hand bowed and returned with dignity je vous remercie monsieur vikentiev vous êtes bien amiable he stared first at marfinka then at her aunt and asked whether she would try over a song with him i will try it by myself or in company with grandmother let us go into the park and i will read you the new novel he then said picking up the book how could i do such a thing asked marfinka looking demurely at her aunt do you think i am a child what is the meaning of this tatiana markovna stammered vikentiev in amazement marfa vasilievna is unendurable he looked at both of them walked into the middle of the room assumed a sugary smile bowed slightly put his hat under his arm and struggling in vain to drag his gloves on his moist hands began mille pardon mademoiselle de vous avoir dérangé sacre bleu s'en entrez pas oh mille pardon mademoiselle <laughs> do stop you foolish boy marfinka bit her lips but could not help laughing just look at him granny how can anybody keep serious when he mimics monsieur charles so nicely stop children cried tatiana markovna her frown relaxing into smiles go and god be with you do whatever you like End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov Translated by M. Bryant This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Raisky's patience had to suffer a hard trial in Vera's indifference. His courage failed him and he fell into a dull, fruitless boredom. In this idle mood he drew village scenes in his sketch album. He had already sketched nearly every aspect of the Volga to be seen from the house or the cliff, and he made notes in his notebooks. He hoped by these occupations to free himself from his obsessing thoughts of Vera. He knew he would do better to begin a big piece of work instead of these trifles, but he told himself that Russians did not understand hard work, or that real work demanded rude strength, the use of the hands, the shoulders, and the back. He thought that in work of this kind a man lost consciousness of his humanity, and experienced no pleasures in his exertions. He shouldered his burden like a horse that seeks to ward off the whip with his tail. Rough manual labor, left no place for boredom, yet no one seeks distractions in work, but in pleasure. Work, not appearances, he repeated, oppressed by the overpowering dullness which drove him nearly mad, and created a frame of mind quite contrary to his gentle temperament. I have no work, I cannot create, as do artists who are absorbed in their work and are ready to die for it. He took his cap and strolled into the outlying parts of the town, then into the town, where he observed every passer-by, stared into the houses, down the streets, and at last found himself standing before the Kozlov's house. Being told that Kozlov was at the school, he inquired for Yuliana Andreevna. The woman who had opened the door to him looked at him askance, blew her nose with her apron, wiped it with her finger, and vanished into the house for good. He knocked again, the dogs barked, and then appeared a little girl, holding her finger to her mouth, who stared at him and departed. 
He was about to knock again, but instead turned to go. As he passed through the little garden, he heard voices, Parisian French, and a woman's voice. He heard laughter and even a kiss. Poor Leonti, he whispered, or rather blind Leonti. He stood uncertain whether to go or stay, then hastened his steps and determined to have speech with Mark. He sought distraction of some kind to rid himself of his mood of depression and to drive away the insistent thoughts of Vera. Passing the warped houses, he left the town and passed between two thick hedges, beyond which stretched on both sides vegetable gardens. "'Where does the market gardener Ephraim live?' he asked, addressing a woman over the hedge who was working in the beds. Silently, without pausing in her work, she motioned with her elbow to a hut standing isolated in the field. As he climbed over the fence, two dogs barked furiously at him. From the door of the hut came a healthy young woman with sunburned face and bare arms holding a baby. She called off the dogs with curses and asked Raisky whom he wished to see. He was looking curiously round since he did not understand how anyone except the peasant and his wife could be living there. The hut, against which were propped spades, rakes, and other tools, planks and pails, had neither yard nor fence. Two windows looked out on the vegetable garden, two others on the field. In the shed were two horses. Here was a pig surrounded by a litter of young, and a hen wandered around, with her chickens. A little further off stood some cars and a big telega. Does Mark Volokov live here? asked Raisky. The woman pointed to the telega in silence. That's his room, she said, pointing to one of the windows. He sleeps in the telega. At this time of day? He only came home this morning, probably rather drunk. Raisky approached the telega. What do you want of him? asked the woman. To visit him? Let him sleep. Why? I'm frightened here alone with him, and my husband won't be here yet. I hope he'll sleep. Does he insult you? No, it would be wicked to say such a thing, but he is so restless and peculiar that I'm afraid of him. She rocked the child in her arms and Raisky looked curiously under the straw covering. Suddenly Mark's tangled hair and beard emerged, and the woman vanished into the hut as he cried, "'Fool, you don't know how to receive visitors!' "'Good day! What has brought you here?' cried Mark as he crawled out of the telega and stretched himself. "'A visit, perhaps? I was taking a walk out of sheer boredom bored with two beautiful girls at home you an artist and you are taking a walk out of sheer boredom don't your affections prosper he winked they are lovely children especially vera how do you know my cousins and in what way do they concern you asked raisky dryly don't be vexed come into my drawing-room tell me rather why you sleep in the telega are you playing at Diogenes? Yes, because I must. They entered the hut and went into a boarded compartment, where stood Mark's bed with a thin old mattress, a thin wadded bed cover and a tiny pillow. Scattered on a shelf on the wall and on the table lay books, two guns hung on the wall, linen and clothes were tumbled untidily on the only chair. This is my salon. Sit down on the bed, and I will sit on the chair. Let us take off our coats, for it is infernally hot. No ceremony, as there are no ladies. That's right. Do you want anything? There is nothing but milk and eggs. If you don't want any, give me a cigar. Many thanks. I have already breakfasted, and it will presently be dinner time. Yes, you live with your aunt. Weren't you expelled after having harboured me in the night? 
on the contrary she reproached me with having allowed you to go to bed without any dessert and for not having demanded pillows and didn't she rail against me as usual but i know it is habit and does not come from her heart she has the best heart one can wish for better than any here she is bold full of character and with a solid understanding now indeed her brain is weakening that is your opinion you have found someone for whom you have sympathy yes especially in one respect she cannot endure the governor any more than i can i don't know what her reasons are his position is enough for me we neither of us like the police we are oppressed by them the old lady is compelled by them to carry out all sorts of repairs to me they pay far too much attention find out where i live whether i go far from the town and whom i visit both fell silent now we have nothing more to talk about why did you come here asked mark because i was bored fall in love raisky was silent with vera continued mark splendid girl and she's related to you it must be easy for you to begin a romance with her raisky made an angry gesture to which mark replied by a burst of laughter call the ancient wisdom to your help he said show outward coldness when you are inwardly consumed indifference of manner pride contempt every little helps parade yourself before her as suits your calling my calling isn't it your calling to be eccentric perhaps remarked raisky indifferently i for instance said mark should make direct for my goal and should be sure of victory you may do the same but you would do so penetrated by the conviction that you stood on the heights and had drawn her up to you you idealist show that you understand your calling and you may succeed it's no use to wear yourself out with sighs to be sleepless to watch for the raising of the lilac curtain by a white hand to wait a week for a kindly glance raisky rose furious ah i have hit the bull's eye raisky put compulsion on himself to restrain his rage for every involuntary expression or gesture of anger would have meant nothing less than acquiescence i should very well like to fall in love but i cannot he yawned counterfeiting indifference it is unsuited to my years and doesn't cure my boredom try it teased mark let us have a wager that in a week you will be as enamoured as a young cat and within two months or perhaps one you will have perpetrated so many follies that you will not know how to get away from here if i am with what will you pay asked raisky in a tone bordering on contempt i will give you my trousers or my gun i possess only two pairs of trousers the tailor has recovered a third pair for debt ah wait i will try on your coat why it fits as if i were poured into a mould try mine why i should like to see whether it suits you please try it on do raisky was indulgent enough to allow himself to be persuaded and put on mark's worn dirty coat well does it suit it fits wear it then you don't wear a coat long while for me it lasts for two years besides whether you are contented or not i shan't take yours off my shoulders you would have to steal it from me raisky shrugged his shoulders does the wager hold asked mark what put you on to that you will excuse me ridiculous idea don't excuse yourself does it hold the wager is not equal you have no possessions don't be disturbed on that account i shall not have to pay if my prophecy comes true then you will pay me three hundred roubles which would come in very conveniently what nonsense 
said Raisky as he stood up and reached for his cap and stick. At the least you will be in love in a fortnight. In a month you will be groaning, wandering about like a ghost, playing your part in a drama or possibly in a tragedy, and ending, as all your like do, with some piece of folly. I know you, I can see through you. But if, instead my falling in love with her, she were to fall in love with me, Vera, with you? Yes, Vera, with me. Then I will find a double pledge and bring it to you. You are a madman, said Raisky, and went without bestowing a further glance on Mark. In one month's time I shall have won three hundred roubles, Mark cried after him. Raisky walked angrily home. I wonder where our charmer is now, he wondered gloomily, probably sitting on her favourite bench, admiring the view. I will see. As he knew Vera's habits, he could say with nearly complete certainty where she would be at any hour of the day. He went over to the precipice and saw her, as he had thought, sitting on the bench with a book in her hand. Instead of reading, she looked out, now over the Volga, now into the bushes. When she saw Raisky, she rose slowly and walked over to the old house. He signed to her to wait for him, but she either did not perceive the sign or did not wish to do so. When she reached the courtyard, she quickened her steps and disappeared within the door of the old house. Raisky could hardly control his rage. And a stupid girl like that thinks that I am in love with her, he thought. She has not the remotest conception of manners. In offering the wager, Mark had stirred up all the bitterness latent in him. He hardly looked at Vera when he sat opposite her at dinner. If he happened to raise his eyes, it was as if he were dazed by a flash of lightning. Once or twice she had looked at him in a kind, almost affectionate way, but his wild glance betrayed to her the agitation of which she deemed herself to be the cause, and to avoid meeting his eyes she bent her head over her empty plate. "'After dinner I shall drive with Muffinka to the hay-harvest,' said Tatiana Markovna to Raisky. Will you bestow on your meadows the honour of your presence, sir? I have no inclination to go, he murmured. Does the world go so hard with you? asked Tatiana Markovna. You are indeed weighed down with work. He looked at Vera, who was mixing red wine with water. She emptied her glass, rose, kissed her aunt's hand and went out. Raisky, too, rose and went to his room. His aunt, Marfinka, and Vikentiev, who had just happened to turn up, drove to the hay harvest, and the afternoon peace soon reigned over the house. One man crawled into the hayrick, another into the outhouse, another slept in the family carriage itself, while others took advantage of the mistress's absence to go into the outskirts of the town. Raisky's thoughts were filled with Vera. Although he had sworn to himself to think of her no more, he could not conquer his thoughts. Where was she? He would go to her and talk it all over. He was inspired only with curiosity, he assured himself. He took his cap and hurried out. Vera was neither in the room nor in the old house. He searched for her in vain on the field, in the vegetable garden, in the thicket, on the cliff, and went to look for her down along the bank of the Volga. When he found no one, he turned homewards, and suddenly came across her a few steps from him, not far from the house. Ah! he cried. There you are. I have been hunting for you everywhere. And I have been waiting for you here, she returned. He felt as if he were suddenly enveloped in winter in the soft airs of the south. You waiting for me? he said in a strange voice and looked at her in astonishment. I wanted to ask you why you pursue me. Raisky looked at her fixedly. 
i hardly ever speak to you it is true that you rarely talk to me but you look at me in such a wild and extraordinary fashion that it constitutes a kind of pursuit and that is not all you quietly follow my steps you get up earlier than i do and wait for me to wake draw my curtains back and open the window whatever way i take in the park and wherever i sit down i must meet you very rarely three or four times a week it would not be often and would not annoy me quite the reverse if it occurred without intention but in your eyes and steps i see only one thing the continual effort to give me no peace to master my every glance word and thought he was amazed at her boldness and independence at the freedom of her speech he saw before him as he imagined the little girl who had nervously concealed herself from him for fear that her egoism might suffer through the inequality of her brains her ideas and her education this was a new figure a new vera what if all this exists only in your imagination he said undecidedly don't lie to me she interrupted if you are successful in observing my every footstep my every moment at least permit me to be conscious of the discomfort of such observation i tell you plainly that it oppresses me it is slavery i feel like a prisoner what do you ask of me my freedom freedom i am your chevalier therefore therefore you will not leave a poor girl room to breathe tell me what reason have i given you to regard me differently from any other girl beauty adores admiration it is her right beauty has also a right to esteem and freedom is it an apple hanging on the other side of the hedge that every passer-by can snatch at don't agitate yourself vera he begged taking her hands i confess my guilt i am an artist have a susceptible temperament and perhaps abandon myself too much to my impressions then i'm no stranger let us be reconciled vera tell me your wishes and they shall be sacredly fulfilled i will do what pleases you will avoid what offends you in order to deserve your friendship i told you from the beginning you remember how you could show me your sympathy by not observing me by letting me go my way and taking no notice of me then i will come of myself and we will fix the hours that we will spend together reading or walking you ask me vera to be utterly indifferent to you yes not to notice how lovely you are to look at you as if you were grandmother but even if i adore your beauty in silence from a distance you would know it and can you forbid me that passion may melt the surface and there may steal into your heart an affection for me don't let me leave you without any hope can you not give me any i cannot how can you tell there may come a time no cousin never unmanned by terror he collected his strength to say breathlessly you are no longer free you love she knit her brows and looked down on the volga and is there any sin if i do will you not permit it cousin she asked ironically i i who bring you the lofty philosophy of freedom how should i not permit you to love love independently of everybody conceal nothing fear neither granny nor any one else the dawn of freedom is red in the sky and shall woman alone be enslaved you love say so boldly for passion is happiness and allow others at least to envy you i concede no one the right to call me to account i am free but you are afraid of grandmother i am afraid of no one grandmother knows it and respects my freedom and my wish is that you should follow her example that is all i wanted to say she concluded as she rose from the bench yes vera now i understand and i am in accord with you he replied rising also here is my hand on it that from to-day you will neither hear nor notice my presence 
she gave her hand but drew it rapidly back as he pressed it to his lips we will see she said but if you don't keep your word we will see say all you have to say vera or my head will go to pieces vera looked long at the prospect before her before she ended with decision then however dearly i love this place i will leave it to go where god's world is wide au revoir cousin a few days later raisky got up about five o'clock the sun was already full on the horizon a wholesome freshness rose from garden and park flowers breathed a deeper perfume and the dew glittered on the grass he dressed quickly and went out into the garden when he suddenly met vera it is not intentional not intentional i swear he stammered in his first surprise they both laughed she picked a flower threw it to him and gave him her hand and in reply to the kiss he gave she kissed him on the forehead it was not intentional vera he repeated you see yourself i see you are good and kind generous he added we have not got to generosity yet she said laughing and took his arm let us go for a walk it's a lovely morning he felt unspeakably happy what coat are you wearing she asked in surprise as they walked it is not yours ah it is mark's is he here how did you come by his coat are you frightened the whole house fears him like fire and he explained how he got the coat she listened absently as they went silently down the main path of the garden vera with her eyes on the ground against his will he felt impelled to seek another argument with her you seem to have something on your mind she began which you don't wish to tell i did wish to but i feared the storm i might draw upon myself you did not wish to discuss beauty once more no no i want to explain what my feeling for you is i am convinced that this time i am not in error you have opened to me a special door of your heart and i recognize that your friendship would bring great happiness and that its soft tones would bring color into my dull life do you think vera that friendship is possible between a man and a woman why not if two such friends can make up their minds to respect one another's freedom if one does not oppress the other does not seek to discover the secret of the other's heart if they are in constant natural intercourse and know how to respect secrets his eyes blazed pitiless woman he broke in she had seen the glance and lowered her eyes we will go in to grandmother she has just opened the window and will call us to tea one word more vera you have wisdom lucidity decision what is wisdom she asked mischievously observation and experience harmoniously applied to life i have hardly any experience nature has bestowed on you a sharp eye and a clear brain is not such a possession disgraceful for a girl your wholesome ideas your cultivated speech you are surprised that a drop of village wisdom should have descended on your poor sister you would have preferred to find a fool in my place wouldn't you and now you are annoyed no vera you intoxicate me you do indeed forbid me to mention your beauty by so much as a syllable and will not hear why i place it so high beauty is the aim and at the same time the driving power of art and i am an artist the beauty of which i speak is no material thing she does not kindle her fires with the glow of passionate desire alone more especially she awakens the man in man arouses thought inspires courage fertilizes the creative power of genius even when that genius stands at the culmination of its dignity and power 
she does not scatter her beams for trifles does not besmirch purity she is womanly wisdom you are a woman vera and understand what i mean your hand will not be raised to punish the man the artist for this worship of beauty according to you wisdom lies in keeping these rules before one's eyes as the guiding thread of life in which case i am not wise i have not received this baptism an emotion closely related to sadness shone in her eyes as she gazed upwards for a moment before she entered the house Reisky anxiously told himself that she was as enigmatic as night itself and he wondered what was the origin of these foreign ideas and whether her young life was already darkened end of chapter 11chapter 12 of the precipice by ivan gancherov translated by m bryant this librivox recording is in the public domain on sunday tatiana markovna had guests for the second breakfast the covers had been removed from the purple damask covered chairs in the reception room yakob had rubbed the eyes of the family portraits with a damp rag and they appeared to look forth more sharply than on ordinary days the freshly waxed floors shone yakob himself paraded in a dress coat and a white necktie while yegorka petrushka and stepka the latter of whom had been fetched from the village and had not yet found his legs had been put into old liveries which did not fit them and smelt of moth the dining room and the reception room had been fumigated just before the meal tatiana markovna herself in a silk dress and shawl with her cap on the back of her head sat on the divan near her the guests had taken their places in accordance with their rank and dignity the place of honour was occupied by neil andreevich tichkov in a dress coat with an order an important old gentleman whose eyebrows met in his great fat face while his chin was lost in his cravat the consciousness of his dignity appeared in every gesture and in his condescending speech next him sat the invariably modest tit nikonich also in a dress coat with a glance of devotion for tatiana markovna and a smile for all then followed the priest in a silk gown with a broad embroidered girdle the councillors of the local court the colonel of the garrison ladies from the town young officials who stood talking in undertones in a corner young girls friends of marhinka who timidly clasped their damp hands and continually changed colour finally a proprietor from the neighbourhood with three half-grown sons when the company had already been assembled for some little time at the breakfast table raisky entered he felt that he was playing the role of an actor fresh to the place making his first appearance on the provincial stage after the most varying reports had been spread about him tatiana markovna introduced him as my nephew the son of my late niece sonichka though everybody knew who he was several people stood up to greet him neil andreevich who expected that he would come and speak to him gave him a friendly smile the ladies pulled their dresses straight and glanced at the mirror the young officials who were standing eating off their plates in the corner shifted from one foot to the other and the young girls blushed still more and pressed their hands as if danger threatened Raisky bowed to the assembled guests and sat down beside his aunt on the divan look how he throws himself down whispered a young official to his neighbour his excellency is looking at him neil andreevich has been wanting to see you for a long time said tatiana markovna aloud adding under her breath his excellency don't forget 
in the same low tone raisky asked who the little lady was with the fine teeth and the well-developed figure shame boris pavlovitch and aloud nil andreevitch borushka has been desiring to present himself to you for a long time raisky was about to reply when tatiana markovna pressed his hand enjoining silence why have you not given me the pleasure of a visit from you before said nil andreevitch with a kindly air good men are always welcome but it is not assuming to visit us old people and the new generation do not care for us do they and you hold with the young people answer frankly i do not divide mankind into the old and the new generation said raisky helping himself to a slice of cake don't hurry about eating talk to him whispered tatiana markovna i will eat and talk at the same time he returned aloud tatiana markovna looked confused and turned her back on him oh, don't disturb him continued nil andreevitch young people are like that i am curious to know how you judge men boris pavlovitch by the impression they produce on me admirable i like you for your candour let us take an example what is your opinion of me i am afraid of you nil andreevitch laughed complacently tell me why you may speak quite plainly why i am afraid of you they say you find fault with everybody he went on heedless of tatiana markovna's efforts to interrupt my grandmother tells me that you lectured one man for not having attended mass tatiana markovna went hot all over and taking off her cap put it down behind her i am glad she told you that i like to have my doings correctly reported yes i do lecture people sometimes do you remember he appealed to the young men at the door at your service your excellency answered one of them quickly putting one foot forward and his hands behind his back i once received one and why i was unsuitably dressed you came to me one sunday after mass i was glad to see you but instead of appearing in a dress coat you came in a short jacket at this point polina karpovna rustled in wearing a muslin dress with wide sleeves so that her white arms were visible almost to the shoulder she was followed by a cadet what heat bonjour bonjour she cried nodding in all directions and then sat down on the divan beside raisky and there is no room here he said and sat down on a chair beside her ah dalia karpovna remarked nil andreevitch good day how are you good day she answered dryly turning away why don't you bestow a kind glance on me and let me admire your swan-like neck the young officials in the corner giggled the ladies smiled and polina karpovna whispered to raisky the rude creature the first word he speaks is folly ah you despise an old man but if i were to seek for your hand do i look like a bridegroom or am i too old for you i decline the honour bonjour natalie ivanovna where did you buy that pretty hat at madame pichet's my husband ordered him from moscow as a surprise for me very pretty but listen seriously cried nil andreevitch insistently i am going to woo you in earnest i need a housekeeper a modest woman who is no coquette and has no taste for finery who never glances at another man and you are an example polina karpovna pretended not to hear but fanned herself and attempted to draw raisky into a conversation in our esteem went on nil andreevitch piteously 
you are a model for our mothers and daughters at church your eyes remain fixed on the sacred picture without a moment's diversion and never even perceive the presence of young men the giggling in the corner increased the ladies made faces in their efforts to restrain their laughter and tatiana markovna tried to divert neil andreevich's attention from her guest by herself addressing her but he returned to the attack you are as retiring as a nun he went on never display your arms and shoulders but bear yourself in accordance with your years why don't you leave me alone returned polina karpovna and turning to raisky she added est-il bête because i wish to marry you you are a suitable pair it will be difficult to find a wife for you we are well matched i was still an assessor when you married the late ivan yegorovitch and that must be how hot it is stifling let us go into the garden please give me my mantilla michel she said turning to the cadet who had come with her at this moment vera appeared and the company rose and crowded round her so that the conversation took another turn raisky was bored by the guests and by the exhibition he had just witnessed he would have left the room but that vera's presence provided a strong incentive to remain vera looked quickly round at the guests said a few words here and there shook hands with the young girls smiled at the ladies and sat down on a chair by the stove the young officials smoothed their coats neil andreevich kissed her hand with evident pleasure and the girls fixed their eyes on her meanwhile marfinka was busily employed in pouring out wine handling dishes and particularly in entertaining her friends vera vasilievna my dear do take my part cried neil andreevich is any one offending you indeed there is there is dalila no uh, pelageya karpovna impertinent creature said that lady aloud as she rose and went quickly towards the door tatiana markovna also rose where are you going polina karpovna she cried marfinka do not let her go no no tatiana markovna came polina karpovna's voice from the hall i am always grateful to you but i do not wish to meet such a loon if my husband were alive no man would dare do not be vexed he means nothing by it but is in reality a decent old gentleman please let me go i will come again and see you when he is not here she said as she left the house in tears in the room she had left every one with a gay humour and neil andreevich condescended to share the general laughter in which however neither raisky nor vera joined polina karpovna might be eccentric but that did not excuse either the loonish amusement of the people assembled or the old man's attacks raisky remained gloomily silent and shifted his feet ominously she is offended and has departed remarked neil andreevich as tatiana markovna visibly agitated returned and resumed her seat in silence it won't do her any harm but will be good for her health she shouldn't appear naked in society this is not a bathing establishment at this point the ladies lowered their eyes and the young girls grew crimson and pressed their hands nervously together neither should she stare about her in church and have young men following her footsteps come ivan ivanovitch you were once her indefatigable cavalier do you still visit her he asked a young man severely not for a long time your excellency i got tired of forever exchanging compliments it's a good thing you have given it up what an example she sets to women and young girls 
going about dressed in pink with ribbons and frills when she is over forty how can anybody help reading her a lecture you see he added turning to raisky that i am only a terror to evil-doers who has made you fear me mark answered raisky to the excitement of all present what mark asked neil andreevich frowning mark volokov who is in exile here ah that thief do you know him we are friends friends hissed the old man tatiana markovna what do i hear don't believe him neil andreevich he does not know what he is talking about what sort of a friend of yours is he why grandmother did you not sup here with me and spend the night didn't you yourself give orders to have a soft bed made up for him marius pavlovitch for pity's sake be silent whispered his aunt angrily but tichkov was already looking at her with amazement the ladies with sympathy while the men stared and the young girls drew closer to one another vera looked round the company thanking raisky by a friendly glance and marfinka hid behind her aunt what a confession you admitted this barabbas under your roof said neil andreevich not i neil andreevich borushka brought him in at night and i did not even know who was sleeping in his room you go round with him at night don't you know that he is a suspicious character an enemy of the administration a renegade from church and society so he has been telling you about me yes raisky said by his description i am a wild beast a devourer of men no you do not devour them but you allow yourself by what right god only knows to insult them and did you believe that until today no and today today i believe it agreed raisky to the terror and agitation of the company most of the officials present escaped to the hall and stood near the door listening how so asked neil andreevich haughtily because you have just insulted a lady you hear tatiana markovna boris pavlovitch borushka she said seeking to restrain him that old-fashioned plate that frivolous dangerous woman what do her faults matter to you who gave you the right to judge other people who gave you the right young man to reproach me do you know that i have been in the service for forty years and that no minister has ever made the slightest criticism to me my right is that you have insulted a lady in my house i should be a miserable creature to permit that if you don't understand that the worse for you if you receive a person who is to the knowledge of the whole town a frivolous butterfly dressing in a way unsuited to her age and leaving unfulfilled her duties to her family well what then then both you and tatiana markovna deserve to hear the truth yes i have been meaning to tell you for a long time matushka frivolity flightiness and the desire to please are not such terrible crimes but the whole town knows that you have accumulated money through bribery that you robbed your own nieces and had them locked up in an asylum yet my grandmother and i have received you in our house and you take it upon yourself to lecture us the guests who heard this indictment were horror-stricken the ladies hurried out into the hall without taking leave of their hostess the rest followed them like sheep and soon all were gone tatiana markovna motioned marfinka and vera to the door but marfinka alone obeyed the indication as for neil andreevich he had become 
deadly pale. Who? he cried. Who has brought you these tales? Speak. That brigand mark? I'm going straight to the governor. Tatiana Markovna, if this young man again sets foot in your house, you and I are strangers. Otherwise, within twenty-four hours, both he and you and your whole household shall be transferred to a place where not even a raven can penetrate with food. Who? Who told him? I will know. Who? Speak! He hissed, gasping for breath and hardly knowing what he said. Stop talking rubbish, Neil Andreevich! commanded Tatiana Markovna, rising suddenly from her place. You will explode with fury. Better drink some water. You ask who has said it. There is no secret about it, for I have said it, and it is common knowledge in the town. Tatiana Markovna! shrieked Neil Andreevich. You have your deserts. Why make so much noise about it? In another person's house you attack a woman, and that is not the action of a gentleman. How dare you speak like that to me? Raisky would have thrown himself on him if his aunt had not waved him aside. Then, with the commanding dignity she knew how to assume, she put on her cap, wrapped herself in her shawl, and went right up to Neil Andreevich, while Raisky looked on in amazement with a sense of his own smallness in her majestic presence. "'Who are you?' she began. "'A clerk in the chancellery, an upstart, and yet you dare to address a noblewoman with violence? You have too good an opinion of yourself.' and have asked for your lesson, which you shall have from me once and for all. Have you forgotten the days when you used to bring documents from the office to my father, and did not dare to sit down in my presence, when you used to receive gifts from my hand on feast days? If you were an honest man, no one would reproach you, but you have, as my nephew says, accumulated stolen wealth, and it has been endured out of weakness. You should hold your tongue and repent in your old age of your evil life. But you are bursting, intoxicated with pride. Sober yourself and bow your head. Before you stands Tatiana Markovna Bereshkov and also my nephew Boris Pavlovich Raisky. If I had not restrained him, he would have thrown you out of the house, but I prefer that he should not soil his hands with you. The lackeys are good enough. As she stood there with blazing eyes, she bore a close resemblance to a portrait of one of her ancestors that hung on the wall. Tychkov, turned his eyes this way and that, seemingly beside himself with rage. I, I shall write to St. Petersburg, he gasped. The town is in danger. Then he slunk out, so agitated by her furious aspect, that he dared not raise his eyes to her face. Tatiana Markovna maintained her proud bearing, though her fingers grasped nervously at her shawl. Raisky approached her hesitatingly, seeing in her not his aunt, but another, and to him an almost unknown woman. I did not understand the majesty of your temperament, but I make my bow, not as a grandson before to an honored grandmother, but as man to woman. I offer you my admiration and respect, Tatiana Markovna, best of women, he said, kissing her hand. I accept your courtesy, Boris Pavlovich, as an honor which I have deserved. Do you accept for your honorable championship the kiss, not of a grandmother, but of a woman? 
as she kissed him on the cheek he received another kiss from the other side this kiss is from another woman said vera in a low voice as she left the room before raisky's outstretched arms could reach her vera and i have not spoken to one another but we have both understood you we do in fact talk very little but we resemble one another said tatiana markovna granny you are an extraordinary woman cried raisky looking at her with as much enthusiasm as if he saw her for the first time drive to the governor's borushka and tell him exactly what has happened so that the other party may not be first with his lying nonsense i'm going to beg polina karpovna's pardon End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the precipice by ivan gonchirov translated by m bryant this librivox recording is in the public domain for three days the impression of this sunday morning breakfast remained with raisky he had been surprised by this sudden transformation of tatiana markovna from grandmother and kindly hostess into a lioness but he had been still more agitated by vera's kiss he could have wept for emotion and would like to have built new hopes on it but it was a kiss that led no further a flash of lightning immediately extinguished raisky kept his promise and neither went to vera's room nor followed her he saw her only at meals and then rarely talked to her he succeeded in hiding from her the fact that she still occupied his thoughts he would like to have wiped out of her recollection his hasty revelation of himself to her then he began a portrait of tatiana markovna and occupied himself seriously with the plan of his novel with vera as the central figure and the scene his own estate and the bank of the volga his fancy took shape and the secret of artistic creation became clear to him it chanced once or twice that he found himself walking with vera gaily and almost indifferently he poured out for her his store of thought and knowledge even of anecdote as he might do to any amiable clever stranger without second thoughts or any wish to reap an advantage he led in fact a peaceful pleasant life demanding nothing and regretting nothing he perceived with satisfaction that vera no longer avoided him that she confided in him and drew closer to him she would herself come to his room to fetch books and he made no effort to retain her they often spent the afternoon with tatiana markovna vera apparently liked to hear him talk and smiled at his jokes though from time to time she would get up suddenly in the middle of a sentence when he was reading aloud or talking and with some slight excuse go out and not appear again for hours he made no effort to follow her he found recreation with friends in the town driving occasionally with the governor or taking part with marfinka and vera in some rural entertainment the month which mark had set as a limit for their wager was nearly over and raisky felt himself free from passion at least he thought so and put down all his symptoms to the working of his imagination and to curiosity on some days even vera appeared to him in the same light as marfinka he saw in them two charming young girls only late left school with all the ideas and adorations of the schoolgirl with the schoolgirl's dream theory of life which is only shattered by experience he told himself that he was absolutely cold and indifferent and in a position truthfully to call himself her friend he would shortly leave the place but before that he must visit barabbas take his last pair of trousers and warn him against making a wager 
he went to leonti to ask where mark was to be found and discovered them both at breakfast you might develop into a decent individual cried mark to him if you were a little bolder you mean if i had the boldness to shoot my neighbor or to storm an inn by night how will you take an end by storm besides there is no need since your aunt has her own guest house many thanks for having chased that old swine from your house i am told in conjunction with tatiana markovna splendid where did you hear that the whole town is talking of it i wanted to come and show my respect to you when i suddenly heard that you were on friendly terms with the governor had invited him to your house and that you and your aunt had stood on your hind paws before him that is abominable when i thought you had only invited him to show him the door that is what is called bourgeois courage i believe i don't know what it is called but i can best give you an example of the kind of courage for some time the police inspector has been sniffing round our vegetable garden so probably his excellency has been kind enough to show an interest in me and to inquire after my health and amusements well i am training a couple of bulldogs and i hadn't had them a week before the garden was clear of cats i have them ready at dark and if the colonel or his suite arrive i shall let my beasts loose of course it will happen by accident i have come to say good-bye for i am leaving here shortly you are going away asked mark in astonishment then added in a low serious voice i should like to have a word with you speak by all means is it a question of money again money as far as i am concerned but it is not of that i wish to speak to you i will come to you later i cannot speak of that now he said looking significantly at kozlov's wife to indicate that he could not explain himself in her presence no one will let you go whispered yuliana andreevna i have not once spoken to you out of hearing of my husband have you brought the money with you asked mark suddenly the three hundred roubles for the wager <laughs> where is the pair of trousers asked raisky ironically i am not joking you must pay me my three hundred roubles why i am not in love as you see i see that you are head over ears in love how do you see that in your face the month is past and with it the wager at an end as i don't need the trousers i will make you a present of them to go with the coat how can you go away complained leonti and the books what books your books see for yourself by the catalogue that they are all right i have made you a present of them be serious for a moment where shall i send them good-bye i have no time to spare don't come to me with the books or i will burn them and you wise man who can tell a lover by his face farewell i don't know whether we shall meet again where is the money it isn't honest not to surrender it i see the presence of love which like measles has not yet come out but soon will your face is already red how tiresome that i fixed a limit and so lose three hundred roubles by my own stupidity good-bye you will not go said mark with decision i shall have another opportunity of seeing you kozlov i'm not starting until next week you will not go repeated mark what about your novel asked leonti you intended to finish it here i am already near the end of it though there is still some arranging to be done which i can do in st petersburg you will not end your romance either neither the paper one nor the real one said mark raisky was about to answer but thought better of it and was quickly gone 
why do you think he won't finish the novel asked leonti he is only half a man replied mark with a scornful bitter laugh raisky walked in the direction of home his victory over himself seemed so assured that he was ashamed of his earlier weakness. He pictured to himself how he would now appear to her in a new and surprising guise, bold, deliberately scornful, with neither eyes nor desire for her beauty, and he pictured her astonishment and sorrow. In his impatience to see the effect of his new development in himself, he stole into her room and crossed the carpet without betraying his presence. She sat with her elbows on the table, reading a letter, written, as he noticed, on blue paper in irregular lines and sealed with common blackish-brown sealing wax. Vera, he said in a low voice, she shrank back with such obvious terror that he too trembled then quickly put the letter in her pocket they looked at one another without stirring you are busy excuse my coming he said and took a step backward as if to leave her she made no answer but gradually recovering her self-possession and without removing her eyes from his face she advanced towards him with her hand still in her pocket it must be a very interesting letter and a great secret he said with a forced laugh since you conceal it so quickly with her eyes still upon him she sat down on the divan show me the letter he laughed betraying his agitation by a tremor of the voice you will not show it he went on as she looked at him in amazement and pressed her hand tighter in her pocket she shook her head i don't need to read it what possible interest could i have in another person's letter i only wanted a proof of your confidence of your friendly disposition towards me you see my indifference see i'm not as i was he said telling himself at the same time that the letter obsessed him she tried to read in his face the indifference in which he was insisting his face indeed wore an aspect of indifference but his voice sounded as if he were pleading for arms you will not show it he said then god be with you and he turned to the door wait she said putting her hand in her pocket and drawing out a letter which she showed him he looked at both sides and glanced at the signature pauline kritsky that is not the letter he said returning it do you see another she asked dryly he replied that he had not uh, fearing that she might accuse him of spying and at her request began to read ma belle charmante divine vera vasilievna i am enraptured and fall on my knees before your dear noble handsome cousin he has avenged me and i am triumphant and weep for joy he was great tell him that he is ever my knight that i am his devoted slave ah how i admire him i would say the word is on the tip of my tongue but i dare not yet why should i not yes i love him i adore him every one must adore him here raisky attempted to return the letter but vera bade him continue as there was a request for him he skipped a few lines and proceeded implore your cousin he adores you do not deny it for i have seen his passionate glances what would i not give to be in your place implore your cousin darling vera vasilievna to paint my portrait i don't really care about the portrait but to be with an artist to admire him to speak to him to breathe the same air with him ma pauvre tête je deviens folle je compte sur vous ma belle et bon ami et j'attends la réponse what answer shall i give her asked vera as raisky laid the letter on the table he was thinking of the other letter wondering why she had hidden it and did not hear her question may i write that you agree god forbid on no account how is it to be done then 
she wants to breathe the same air as you i should stifle in that atmosphere but if i ask you to do it whispered vera you what difference can it make to you he asked trembling i should like to say something pleasant to her she returned but did not add that she seized this means of detaching him from herself polina karpovna would not lightly let him out of her hands should you accept it as a sign of friendship if i fulfilled your wish well then as she nodded i make two conditions one that you should be present at the sittings otherwise i should be clearing out at the first sitting do you agree then as she nodded unwillingly the second is that you show me the other letter which letter the one you hid so quickly in your pocket there isn't another you would not have hidden this letter in terror will you show the other you are beginning again she said reproachfully you need not trouble i was only jesting but for god's sake do not look on me as a despot or a spy it was mere curiosity god be with you and your secrets i have no secrets she returned dryly as he rose to go do you know that i am soon leaving he asked suddenly i heard so is it true why do you doubt she dropped her eyes and said nothing you will be glad for me to go yes she answered in a whisper why he said sadly and came nearer she thought for a moment drew out another letter glanced through it carefully scratching out a word or a line here and there and handed it to him read that letter she said again slipping her hand into her pocket he began to read the delicate handwriting i am sorry dear natasha and then asked who is natasha the priest's wife my school friend ah the pope's wife it is your own letter that is interesting and he became absorbed in the reading i am sorry dear natasha the letter ran that i have not written to you since my return as usual i have been idle but i had other reasons which you shall learn the chief reason you already know here some words were scratched out which agitates me very much but of that we will speak when we meet the other reason is the arrival of our relative boris pavlovich raisky for my misfortune he scarcely ever leaves the house so that for a fortnight i did hardly anything except hide from him what an abundance of reason of different kinds of knowledge of brilliance of talent he brought with him and with it all what unrest he upsets the whole household he had hardly arrived before he was seized with the firm conviction that not only the estate but all that lived on it were his property taking his stand on a relationship which hardly deserves the name and on the fact that he knew us when we were little he treated us as if we were children or schoolgirls although i have hidden myself from him i have only just succeeded in preventing him from seeing how i sleep and dream and what i hope and wait for this pursuit has almost made me ill and i have seen no one written to no one i feel like a prisoner it is as if he were playing with me perhaps quite against his own will one day he is cold and indifferent the next his eyes are ablaze and i fear him as i would a madman the worst of all seems to me to be that he does not know himself so that no reliance can be placed on his plans and promises he decide on one course and the next day takes another he himself says he is nervous susceptible and passionate and he may be right he is no play actor and does not disguise himself he is i think too sensible and well-bred indeed too honest for that he is by way of being an artist draws writes improvises very nicely on the piano and dreams of art 
yet it seems to me that he does substantially nothing but is spending his life as he says in the adoration of beauty he is a lover by temperament like do you remember dashenka semichkin who fell in love with a spanish prince whose portrait she had seen in a german calendar and would admit no one not even the piano tuner kish but boris pavlovich is full of kindness and honour is upright gay original but all these qualities are so disconnected and uncertain in their expression that we don't know what to make of them now he seeks my friendship but i am afraid of him am afraid he may do anything am afraid here some lines were crossed out ah if only he would go away it is terrible to think he may one day here again words were crossed out and i need one thing rest the doctor says i am nervous must spare myself and avoid all agitation thank god he is also attached to grandmother and i am left in peace i do not want to step out of the circle i have drawn for myself and nobody else should cross the line in its sanctity lies my peace and my whole happiness if raisky oversteps this line the only course that remains to me is to fly from here that is easy to say but where and then i have some conscience about it because he is so good so kind to me and my sister and means to make a gift to us of this place this paradise where i have learned to live and not to vegetate it lies on my conscience that he should squander these undeserved tokens of affection that he tries to be brilliant for my sake and to awaken in me some affection although i have denied him every hope ah if he only knew how vain his efforts are now i will tell you about him the letter went no further and raisky looked at the lines as if he were trying to read behind them vera had said practically nothing about herself she remained in the shadow while the whole garish light fell on him there was another letter he said sharply written on blue paper vera had not left the room but someone's hand was on the lock who is there asked raisky with a start in the doorway appeared vasilisa's anxious face it's i she said in a low voice it's a good thing you are here boris pavlovich they are asking for you please make haste there is nobody in the hall yakob is at church yegorka has been sent to the volga for some fish and i am alone with pashutka who is asking for me a gendarme from the governor the governor asks you to go to see him at once if possible if not to-morrow morning the business is pressing very well i will go please as quickly as possible then he has also come who the man they would like to horsewhip he has made himself at home in the hall and is waiting for you the mistress and marfa vasilievna have not yet returned from the town didn't you ask his name he gave his name but i have forgotten he's the man who stayed the night with you when you were drinking please boris pavlovich be quick pashutka and i have locked ourselves in why because we were afraid i climbed out of the window into the yard to come and tell you if only he does not nose anything out raisky went with her laughing he sent a message by the gendarme that he would be with the governor in an hour then he sought out mark and led him into his room do you wish to spend the night with me he asked ironically i am indeed a night bird answered mark who looked anxious i receive too much attention in the daytime and it puts less shame on your aunt's house the magnificent old lady to show tichkov the door but i have come to you on important business he said looking serious you have business that is interesting yes more serious than yours to-day i was at the police station not exactly paying a call 
the police inspector had invited me and i was politely fetched with a pair of gray horses what has happened a trifling thing i had lent books to one or two people perhaps mine that you had taken from leonti those and others here is the list he said handing him a slip of paper to whom did you give the books to many people mostly young people one fool the son of an advocate did not understand some french phrases and showed the book to his mother who handed it on to the father and he in his turn to the magistrate the magistrate having heard of the name of the author made a great commotion and informed the governor at first the lad would not give me away but when they applied the rod to him he gave my name and to-day they summoned me to court and what line did you adopt <laughs> what line said mark laughing as he looked at raisky they asked me whose books they were and where i had got them and i said from you some you had brought with you others voltaire for instance i have found in your library i am much obliged why did you put this honour on me nobody will meddle with you since you are in his excellency's favour then you are not living here under official compulsion but i shall be sent off to a third place of exile this is already the second at any other time this would be a matter of indifference to me but just now for the time being at least i should like to stay here and what else nothing i only wanted to tell you what i have done and to ask whether you will take it on yourself or not but what if i won't and i don't intend to then instead of your name i will give kozlov's he is growing mouldy here let him go to prison he can take up his greeks again later no he will never take them up again if he is robbed of his position and of his bread and butter there you are right my conclusions were illogical it would be better for you to take it on yourself what are you to me that i should do so on the former occasion i needed money and you had what i lacked this is the same case no one will touch you while i should be sent off i'm now logical enough you ask a remarkable service i'm just going to the governor who has sent for me good-bye he has sent for you then what am i to do what should i say say that you are the hero of the peace and the governor will quash the whole matter for he does not like sending special reports to st petersburg with me it is quite different i am under police supervision and it is his duty to return a report every month as to my circumstances and my mode of life however he added with apparent indifference do as you like and now come for i have no more time either let us go as far as the wood together and i will climb down the precipice i will wait at the fisherman's on the island to see how the matter ends at the edge of the precipice mark vanished into the bushes raisky drove to the governor's and returned home about two o'clock in the morning although he had gone so late to bed he rose early the windows of Vera's room were still darkened. She is still sleeping, he thought, and he went into the garden where he walked up and down for an hour, waiting for the drawing back of the lilac curtain. He hoped Marina would cross the yard, but she did not come. Then Tatiana Markovna's window was opened. The pigeons and the sparrows began to gather on the spot where they were wont to receive crumbs from Marfinka doors opened and shut the grooms and the servants crossed the yard but the lilac curtain remained untouched the gloomy savelli came out of his room and looked silently round the yard when raisky called him he came towards him with slow steps tell marina to let me know when vera vasilievna is dressed uh, marina is not here where is she she started at dawn to accompany the young lady over the volga what young lady vera vasilievna yes 
how did they go and with whom in the britchka with the dun horse uh, they will return in the evening he added do you think they will return today ostrysky with interest assuredly prohor with the horse and marina too they will see the young lady safely there and return immediately Raisky looked at Savelli without seeing him, and they stood opposite one another for some time speechless. "'Have you any further orders?' Savelli asked at length. Raisky recovered himself and inquired whether Savelli was awaiting Marina. Savelli replied by a curse on his wife. "'Why do you beat her?' asked Raisky. "'I have been intending for a long time to advise you to leave her alone.' "'I don't beat her any more.' since when for the last week since she has stayed quietly at home go i have no orders but do not beat marina it will be better both for you and her if you give her complete liberty raisky passed on his way with bent head glancing sadly at vera's window savelli's eyes too were on the ground and he had forgotten to put his cap on again in his amazement at Raisky's last words. Passion once more, thought Raisky. Alas, for Savelli and for me. End of chapter 13。Chapter 14 of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Since Vera's departure, Raisky had experienced the meaning of unmitigated solitude. He felt as if he were surrounded by a desert, now that he was deprived of the sight of her, although nature around him was radiant and smiling. Tatiana Markovna's anxious solicitude, Marfinka's charming rule, her songs, her lively chatter with the gay and youthful Vikentiev, the arrival and departure of guests, the eccentricities of the freakish Polina Karpovna, none of these things existed for him. He only saw that the lilac curtain was motionless, the blinds had been drawn down, and that Vera's favorite bench remained empty. He did not want to love Vera, and if he had wished it, he ought still to resist, for Vera had denied him every hope. Indeed, her beauty seemed to have lost its power over him, and he was now drawn to her by a different attraction. What is Vera's real nature? he asked his aunt one day. See for yourself. She recognizes only her own understanding and her own will. She was born in my arms and has spent her whole life with me, yet I do not know what is in her mind what are her likes and dislikes i do not force her or worry her so that she can hardly think herself unfortunate you see for yourself that my girls live with me as free as the birds of the air you are right grandmother it is not fear or anxiety or the power of authority that binds you to them but the tenderest of home ties they adore you and so they ought to do, but it is the fruit of their upbringing. Why should worn-out conceptions of duty be pressed upon them, and why should they live like caged birds? Let them dip into the reservoir of life itself. A bird imprisoned in a cage loses the capacity for freedom, and even if the door of his cage is opened, he will not take flight. I have never tried to exercise restraint on Marfinka or Vera, supposing a respectable rich man of old and blameless family were to ask for Marfinka's hand, and she refused, do you think I should persuade her? Well, Granny, I leave Marfinka to you, but do not attempt to do anything with Vera. You must not restrain her in any way, must leave her her freedom. One bird is born for the cage, another for freedom. Vera will be able to direct her own life. Do I restrain or repress her? 
i am like the police inspector who only sees that there is an outward semblance of order i do not penetrate below the surface unless my assistance is invited tell me grandmother what sort of a woman is this priest's wife and what are the links that bind her to vera natalia ivanovna and vera made friends at a boarding school she is a good modest woman is she sensible possibly a woman of weight and character oh no she is not stupid is fairly educated a great reader and fond of dress the pope who is much liked by the local landowner is not poor and lives in comfort on his own land he is a sensible man belongs to the younger generation but he leads too worldly a life for the priesthood as is the custom in landed society he reads french books and smokes for instance things that are unsuited to the priestly garb every glance of verochka's every mood of hers is sacred to natalia ivanovna whatever she may say is wise and good this suits vera who does not want a friend but an obedient servant that is why she loves the pope's wife and vera loves you too asked raisky who wanted to know if vera loved anybody else except the pope's wife yes she loves me answered tatiana markovna with conviction but in her own fashion she never shows it and never will though she loves me and would be ready to die for me and you love vera ah how i love her she sighed and tears stood in her eyes she does not know but perhaps one day she may learn have you noticed how thoughtful she has been for some time is she not in love he added in a half whisper but immediately regretted the question which it was too late to withdraw his aunt started back as if a stone had hit her god forbid she cried making the sign of the cross this sorrow has been spared us do not disturb my peace but confess as you would to the priest if you know anything raisky was annoyed with himself and made an effort partially successful to pacify his aunt i have not noticed anything more than you have she would hardly be likely to say anything to me that she kept secret from you yes yes it is true she will say nothing the pope's wife knows everything but she would rather die than betray vera's secrets her own secrets she scatters for anyone to pick up but not vera's with whom could she fall in love remarked tatiana markovna after a silence there is no one here no one interrupted raisky quickly tatiana markovna shook her head then went on after a while there might be the forester he is an excellent individual and has shown an inclination i notice he would be certainly an admirable match for vera but well she is so strange heaven knows how any one would dare how any man would woo her he is splendid well established and rich the wood alone yields thousands is the forester young educated a man that counts vasilisa entered and announced polina karpovna the evil one himself has brought her grumbled tatiana markovna show her in and be quick with breakfast End of chapter fourteen